All right, hey, ladies and gentlemen, go ahead and get started. Um, so what we have here today is uh, uh, Harry Jowart and myself, we're going to give you a, sort of a combined uh, sh uh, short narrative, a little bit of a history, a uh, recent history uh, of the 508. You'll get another touch of that this afternoon from the Sergeant's Major, and then, uh, and then you'll, we'll close it out uh, tomorrow night with, uh, with the battalion commander. So excited about hearing these multiple different generations. Uh, this is uh, of the GWAT era. Um, recent history in a lot of ways, but uh, also has a lot of connective tissue to back to all uh, all wars and all history. And so you'll see some of the, the, the that connected piece as well. So Harry, I'm gonna have Harry start. Uh, and uh, the time frame is what? Put us in the time frame. What December? Uh, for uh, for Afghanistan. Start in 2006. <laughs> you certainly can. Yeah. yeah. Um, so real quick, uh, I believe it was January of 2006. Young private me on his way to Afghanistan having no idea what's going on. Um, and and as, I, as I speak and kind of talk about Afghanistan and then later on Iraq, just like Colonel Browning said, there's lots of, there's lots of similarities, there's many more differences. Having been to Afghanistan, it's, Starting off in January 2006, going again in 14, a 9-10 trip between that, that was one part of armying, war, whatever you want to call it, that I saw. And I assumed it was all like that. Um, you're very typical, you know, going through streets, clearing houses, things of that nature. It was very, very fast paced, tired. There was no people really that were living outside of the people you'd go into the house and it was the wrong house and they'd huddled up, but there was no interaction with like the living populace. So fast forward to when did we leave in December 31st, December 7th, 16th, 17th, uh, 16th, 16th, uh, New Year's Eve. to OIR. Again, now Sergeant First Class Joward is going to Iraq having no idea what's going to go on. Uh, because leading up to it, we had been told and trained that this was a different type of deployment. It wasn't going to be the typical air moves, clearances, land holder, however. We'll see what we'll, we'll kind of see when we get there. Um, and immediately, OIR is Operation Iraqi. Operation Inherit Resolve. Inherit Resolve, okay. So, as soon as we landed in Erbil, I realized this was not the war I was familiar with because I got an F-150. I drove through Erbil with no kit, no nothing on, out to Philfall. And from that day forward, it was a learning experience every day. Finally, when we went to the first push to Mosul, I saw something that never resonated with me prior because I never thought about it. In all the previous deployments, I never wondered where the people were, because the only people that were there were the ones who were actively trying to get me out of wherever I was. The families, the average person trying to make a living, never thought about them. And as soon as we pull into town, you see hordes of dislocated people moving back through rubble, trying to find anything left, I suppose. And that, at that point, I, in talking about it, I say I have that uh, combat culture shock because <coughs> I'd never seen that before. I never got to see the people really get pushed out. I just assumed these were ghost towns. So through, through the whole trip there in the OIR, these, these people moving from place to place in large groups with what they had really kind of resonated with me. And it caught me off guard. And I almost had to soften kind of how I thought about things in, re in regards to the people. Because all those previous deployments, I never realized that there were people in these homes that weren't a part of things. So I got to see that. I don't know if you ex experienced the same thing, sir. Yeah. And then the final thing that I really pulled out of it was the foreign involvement. So at Phil Fall, great place, a wonderful place to eat dinner. Uh, we had French artillery, there was Finnish special forces, 
SAS came through once in a while. A lot of different nations working out of this, this little cop, we'll call it. Um, and I made pretty good relationships with those people because I saw them every day. Uh, it, kind of a funny, funny story. The French Marine Artillery, they've got, they call them Caesars. They're dump trucks with 155 guns on them. So they have 12 in their, their fleet. The entire Marine Artillery Force has 12 of them. They told whoever their hire was that they had four in country. And I look out back, and, but there's 12. It's like, yeah, don't worry about it. Two weeks later, they get a surprise visit, and we have to hide the remaining eight Caesars <laughs> under camo nets, down IV lines, uh, so they, you know, so they wouldn't see that they brought the whole, the whole fleet, so to speak. And then I got to thinking, there's a lot of there's a lot of effort in what we're doing here. The Finnish special operations guys, they were big in UAV stuff, and they were doing all sorts of stuff. Um, essentially, we're never there, as Moshku would say. We're not here. Uh, and I really thought about that. The efforts that the entire world, for lack of a better term, was putting into this location, and I was a part of it. I had two very profound moments. Seeing all those people moving in their hordes, trying to rebuild, and then seeing all these different nations working together towards a common goal, looking out for one another. It was two things I'd never seen in any previous deployment, and I think it's what makes the Operation Inherent Resolve trip that much more meaningful. And then, of course, being able to work with the, the hero of Mosul, uh, that's just a bonus. But that's my, that was my experience in OIR. Uh, it was not a typical deployment. Every day was something new, and I mean, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Sir? Yeah, so uh, if you could. Do me a favor and flip. I yep. don't know how to get that thing moving. All right, so one of uh, the things, Harry, for that, and, it, and really that's, uh, that's sort of a common theme, right? So anyone that's served in two different types of uh, combat areas uh, and two different eras of combat um, probably know this best. Uh, if, you're a, you know, if you're a Korea War vet and a Vietnam vet, two very different types of fighting. If you have gone uh, to Operation Just Cause, and you may have also been in Desert Storm, two very different types of fighting. Our last 20 years, and this is representative of the folks that are sitting at these tables over here, our last 20 years has been focused in on either an initial uh, break-in or a counterinsurgency. When we got called up to do uh, this counter-ISIS campaign, one of the things that we just could not be prepared for is the level of authority that we got who got that authority, and then all the individuals uh, and uh, allies and partners, as Harry mentioned, that were going to be attached to us and, and working with us, and in some cases, we worked for. Um, that, was a, that was a bit of a shock to the system. It was a shock to the system because we already had a mental model on how we were going to do this. We're going to go in, we're going to eat some ice cream, going to hang out, go on some patrols, come back, eat some more ice cream. It's in our air-conditioned tent. That's sort of the, the mental model for a lot of us, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe go on an air assault raid, might go do a couple things here and there. When we get there, and Harry didn't mention, it's like, there, there is no body uh, providing you food. You gotta, you gotta go out there and cook it. Um, you, what, you wanna get warm? Get whatever's in your bag and put it on. Uh, and when we, when we started going in the campaign, it was jumps and jumps and jumps. Uh, from different locations, and not airborne jobs, but uh, hopping of different uh, tactical uh, command posts. And it was taking over a building, living there for a week, moving to the next location. And it's what you, whatever you had in your back, whatever you had uh, in your truck, that's what you had for, uh, for eight months. And so, again, a very different type of feel, um, and the adversary was very different. And when you have the nation as well as the world behind you, it's different than, say, going to Af uh, in Afghanistan or in Iraq to go after uh, so, some adversary that you know, half the world believes is an adversary. And there is not a single nation that thought ISIS should survive. And so when you have that sort of narrative of coming across the globe, the fighting is very different. Uh, there's a lot of skin in the game, if you will. 
So uh, a couple of things that uh, some of the big ideas that we got um, that we ha that ha happened during this campaign um, <coughs> was the very first thing is you know how do you protect ourselves as well as our partners and so these are all our allies and partners our biggest one obviously are the Iraqis um, and, and the Iraqi security forces the second big thing was uh, partners are always the main effort we all, we generally try to uh, to always focus in on. What is it that they can do today uh, to be able to move us 10 meters, 100 meters down uh, in this city block? Uh, the third big idea was attack ISIS. And everywhere and anywhere you possibly can, and it, as you can imagine, it's not just specifically, uh, it's not just shooting uh, in, in uh, <coughs> direct fire combat. It's also cyber attacks. This is also electronic warfare. This is also enveloping on multiple different, multiple different ways. It's about jamming them. It's about being able to break up their communication. The power that they had over us was their, their will to survive and their will to be able to put their narrative out. Every chance they had, they were pushing out a new, uh, a new blast on cyber, new, a new blast on social media. It, we just could not keep up to, uh, up to pace with them. And so <clears throat> attacking them everywhere we uh, possibly could. A shared understanding, not necessarily with the world, but because we were so dispersed, uh, we were one task force among four different task force. Uh, back there, Aaron, uh, his, his team was down there, in, uh, uh, down way down south, <coughs> attacking from a different location. And so dispersed in probably a spread of somewhere between 100 to 140 kilometers between any organization, you had to have a way to communicate uh, every day, every night, at the speed uh, of, of, of what you need. Uh, the last bit is agility. <coughs> you never wanted your partners waiting for you. So what that meant a lot is if they're getting ready to go fight and they want to mobilize, you got to pick up and fight and mobilize as well. Uh, and it, it seems intuitive, but it's harder than you think. Uh, because the, uh, because your, your partners are able to move in different ways that you can't, either <coughs> their vehicles are lighter than yours, and so you can't take the same crossing points, so you got to figure out something pretty quick. Or you, you don't have the backing of your... Uh, of your chain of command to go in certain places. And so that becomes a, a, a pretty dramatic uh, state as well. All right, counter ISIS campaign uh, started from January 2017 to September 2017, sort of the, the, the full grasp of this. Phil Fowl, you can, uh, where Harry just talked about, was way up north. Uh, Talafar is the, tw the twin city to, uh, to, to Mosul. So Mosul was, the, um, was where the caliphate started. This is where ISIS decided to stand up their campaign to be able to, to expand their region uh, and to become their own country. They were their own entity. Talafar was their twin city, uh, and by twin city, they, this, is their, this is their connective tissue between the two. This is their, uh, their connection back to Syria. And so you have two major, major efforts in, in regards to ISIS. They own most of northern Iraq as well as northern Syria at the time, at the height of their, uh, of their campaign. So this is really where, uh, for, for the most part, uh, wh where we're at. If you can look at every little black dot, those are all the little jumps that we had to make over time. Imagine about every three to four weeks, we're making a different move to get to a different location. If you look at it from uh, TA Falafels, where we started, going to the right or uh, to the east, you go to Shalat, and we basically did a hook around Mosul. Mosul split up into two sides of the same, uh, of one river, the Tigris River, uh, east and west. They would call it the left side and the right side. Interesting, um, not west or east. The right side of the river, uh, right side of Mosul, is the, uh, the east side. And that was the first element that was uh, taken down. Very first going into this, um, we realized one, uh, there's a level of destruction that was needed to be able to unhinge individuals that are determined uh, and that don't want to leave. Uh, so there was an aspect of trying to figure out how do we get this? Like how much danger you put yourself in and, try, uh, and attempt to try to be able to pull them out. So this talks about the authorities very, very right up front. Whereas in Afghanistan, it takes a one-star general to drop a bomb. Um, the, uh, at that time, they adjusted it and made it to uh, an O3 captain. Uh, and they, they pushed it to a first lieutenant when needed. 2,000 pounders is probably about the, the, the weapon of choice, uh, and the, the clearance requirements for a, uh, a drop uh, was a first lieutenant, to, uh, and he could approve that uh, in any particular uh, type of combat. So uh, whether that's offensive or defensive, and that was being able to positively identify the enemy, uh, either with direct uh, vision or, or over uh, with the UAS capability. We had hand-held uh, thrown uh, type of, uh, uh, type of un- uh, uh, unmanned aircraft, as well as uh, the quadcopters as well, you're probably familiar with. 
later on in the fight. <clears throat> so using those, the, using those systems and, uh, and that capability, it gave us a, a speed as well as a lethality that was incredibly accurate while at the same time uh, very, very destructive. And when you're able to put that much firepower in a very compressed city, this city is about the size of, uh, it's the second largest city in, the, um, in, in Iraq. Uh, second most popular city in uh, Iraq next to ba Baghdad. Uh, it's about the size of uh, a smaller city, something like, uh, uh, well, they say about Cincinnati size um, in, in regards to people uh, and the, the, uh, the density of people. So that, that gives you just an idea of how kind of thick and how, uh, how challenging this is. And you can think of, it has every everything you would want from a, ma a major university. Uh, Mosul was a, um, a a city of antiquity, as well as a city that was technologically advanced as well. So you get a, a strange diversity there. Uh, this was the highest population of Christians in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, uh, the very old, some of the oldest uh, churches are actually in, um, are actually in Mosul uh, of the world. Uh, so uh, there are actually more, there were more churches than there were mosques in Mosul. Uh, this is where your Christian population lives. So again, it's a very different type of feel. Uh, in 2013, uh, ISIS came in and in three days took the entire city, kicking some individuals out, gathering a few of them up, rounding them up, and, uh, and basically killing them. Um, there was a, a, uh, a small military army outfit that was up to the northern portion of, uh, of Mosul. They didn't get warned in time, uh, and ISIS overran them and uh, basically wiped out 5,000 troops. So there's a lot of things associated with the amount of death and a, amount of things that have happened uh, from 2013 to 2017. We just didn't, we could no longer stand it as a world anymore. So as I said, <clears throat> this is the east side of the Mosul campaign. Um, you can see a small picture there. Uh, this, you know, we typically would try to get gain uh, uh, points of uh, advantage while be able to be able to get an overhead view shot of these uh, uh, little drop bombs. The uh, Iraqis had no limitations on uh, the amount of damage that they had to do. So you can imagine when you, when you compress uh, Iraqi, three Iraqi divisions into a very small city, uh, and they're able, they able to put out somewhere between 10 to 20,000 rounds of, uh, of 155 uh, field artillery just in the first two months uh, of, the, of the campaign. Um, it is very, very destructive and very hard to walk through. Uh, so <clears throat> as we conducted this first initial clearance, cleared this out so that you can see the river going down the center, <coughs> completely wiped out that, uh, that, that side. And this is where we learned how to use our authorities that were given to us. This is where we learned, where we were teaching young captains, young lieutenants on how to get, grant that authority and to be able to positively identify their enemy and be able to, to knock them down. We had a few mistakes early on. One of the bigger mistakes as we, as we, did, we came into um, uh, the second half of this is uh, ISIS had little care of civilian uh, life uh, and they used it to their advantage. Um, so w we saw the first cases of uh, human shields early on. Um, they would uh, shoot from the top of a rooftop, a mortar round or something along those lines, uh, and basically to bait us to drop a bomb on them. Uh, this happened uh, probably one of the more significant days in, um, in February of 2017. They baited us one night where uh, we had a positive invocation, probably a small team of uh, ISIS fighters on top of the building. Uh, it was raining, so it was a little hard to get our uh, ab absolute overhead view of it. We went ahead and said, okay, we've identified them. It's a two-story building. There are no other civilians anywhere that we can see. Let's go ahead and drop the building. So we dropped the building uh, with a, very, a, a fairly small type of bomb, about 500 pounds. And there were three consecutive explosions after from that same building. The building was rigged. We come back, we take a look, and we open it up. Uh, they had packed in 100 people underneath the building in a basement. Uh, we realized we made the mistake not because we went down there and checked it out, because within 10 minutes, uh, they published a video saying that the United States and their uh, Iraqi security forces are out there to kill civilians. And that was a message that they wanted to send. And they sacrificed themselves to be able to get that message because they knew that they were losing, and they were losing campaign in a lot of ways, but this is a way that they could win. And if you can get the world to see that we are being unresponsible about the way we're fighting, some of the Vietnam veterans know this almost too well. If you can get the world to see that we are not fighting a clean way and are not fighting in a just way, that's one of the quickest ways you can get out. 
they get pulled out. And so we had to be very responsible with, with every time we had a civilian casualty, which was pretty much a, pretty much a daily effort, daily, a daily situation. I was under 117 investigations while I was in, in command during that time frame. Um, it, it just happens. Um, and, and you have the chain of command that's willing to take that authority and be able to give you the immunity that you need to be able to continue to fight. So that was really important. Defenses, uh, there are all different types of defenses. When you have three years to prepare for a defense uh, and you own a city, and the Americans were there in Mosul for about, at that point, I wanna say up to ten, a little over 10 years. Imagine the amount of concrete material that the Americans have left there, which we did. They took, I they, think they, the magnitude is just incredible, but um, imagine, uh, imagine Columbus and you put a concrete barrier, 12 foot high, these are the, these uh, massive uh, concrete barriers, T barriers, walled the entire city in. That was step one. Step two, you can see this, uh, this trench line, it's an anti-tank ditch. They tried to anyway. Right in front of the concrete barrier, they dug this ditch. It was about 70 miles around the city. The third thing they did was, as we were approaching from the south and uh, coming out of Q West, they had a screen line down and set up in the, in the bottom. So we would try to enter from the south the way that we wanted to attack in the Mosul, and the way we wanted to penetrate was from the south. Um, every 10 meters, they cut the road for 30 miles. And what I mean by cut the road, they took a bulldozer, cut pavement completely out, six foot wide, about six foot deep, and they did it every 10 meters for 30 miles. Uh, so trying to even get to the screen line uh, took us weeks to get to that location. Uh, and every day we had to do is fill the position in, drive over, fill it in, drive over. It would take us, I don't know, uh, 10, 12 hours just to get uh, less than half a mile uh, because of the amount of effort it would took. And we try to bypass as much as you can, but just like any good defense, you tie it into natural terrain. So they were, they were breaking up the road, the, our entrance into the city. So three years to prepare for this. They knew we were going to come. They knew which direction we would come. There's only one way to come. And so the, the effort uh, for counter obstacles was incredible to watch. And most of it was done by the Iraqis. They went out there, they bulldozed everything, all these holes in, they tried their best to get us into, the, into this location. So as we started to, to get into a position down the south of Mosul, uh, one of the things we identified very quickly was that uh, we weren't the only ones fighting there, as, uh, as Harry mentioned. We were fighting with our Iraqi security forces, but <clears throat> uh, the Iranian uh, forces were there as well, fighting ISIS on a different flank. So your enemy of your enemy is your friend in this particular case. We had Russian advisors fighting next to us as well. We had um, what we now uh, recognize as Hezbollah. Hezbollah was fighting next to us as well. And so this, this becomes a very diverse and dynamic situation because you have no official communication with them. But at the same time, you don't want to shoot them and you don't want to be shot by them. And so creating markers to be able to identify who you are versus them was key. The way that we identified our partners is we actually, we gave every Humvee we gave them, we threw a little tracker on them. Um, we gave them phones that had trackers on them. Uh, and we found that to be very useful. You can, can kind of get a sense of where the front line was at. You kind of got a sense of where their troops were at. Uh, but occasionally when ISIS got the, the upper hand, they would steal these trucks. They would steal these phones. They would get access to, to uh, our, our front line. And we thought that was bad. Let's, let's turn these off. Then we realized, wait a minute. It's not bad. It's good. They know exactly where they are. <laughs> We tracked everywhere they went. In fact, we never turned them off. And they never quite figured it out. And every time they stopped anywhere for longer than a day, we blew that house up. And anytime they stopped doing another, another day, we blew their house up. I'm sure they kind of caught on after a while. But when you steal a brand new Humvee, and it's, you know, it's nice, sell all kinds of comms equipment, who do you give it to? If you're, you know, you're a young ISIS leader, like, ah, I want to give this to my boss. I want to give it to the ISIS commander. So during this time, when we, uh, when we got uh, the first few Iraqis were, um, uh, uh, that got nabbed um, uh, up near the airport, just south of Mosul, the, the very first group that got nabbed, that truck went in there for about three months until we finally blew it up, and we got positive uh, communication that we ended up killing uh, the commander. 
Now the conveyor had changed out probably by about the, by the time that we had gotten done seven different times, uh, and the uh, the way you identified him, um, he was wearing this ring. Uh, this is his uh, this is the commander's ring. Um, if you take a look at him, you guys can come up here afterwards. This ring has a uh, yarn on it. Anybody know why? Different sizes. Different sizes. Yeah. The the last guy, last guy was really skinny. Uh, lost a ton of weight, and so they put yarn on it so that they could fit on his finger. So they, we ended up pulling off the guy's hand. We knew who he was at the end, um, and it was the, the last final the last final throws. Um, but keeping a reliable communication is important, uh, particularly for people that you don't have communication with. Hand and arm signals are are absolutely key. But hey, the simple things like hey, I I've got a red flashlight on my truck. Please don't shoot me. Uh, I know that we're not we're we're not friends, but uh, I don't want to have to shoot you back, right? Um, it became pretty apparent when, uh, particularly when Iranians started putting their own UAVs into into Mosul, that we were going to have some problems. Uh, a couple of their bombs dropped a little too close to us. We had to <coughs> shoot down their UAVs. They weren't too happy about it. But everyone has the same effort. We're all trying to to be able to close in on the city to eradicate this force, and that word is pretty key. This isn't about rehabilitation. This isn't about taking prisoners. The word we got was eradicate. They can no longer exist. If you can capture a few, sure. And if you're wondering why the Finnish are there, or why the Belgium were there, or why the Germans or the British were there, not necessarily in large groups. They weren't necessarily there because they wanted to get their kill off. No. <laughs> they were looking for their citizens. They want to make sure that their citizens didn't come home. They may want to make sure that they never had to go on to trial and that they died in combat. You got a British fighter fighting for ISIS, and you bring him home and extradite out of Iraq. What do you think that's going to turn into? Turns into a circus. Turns into him being, or she being, paraded around and probably secured for the rest of her life. So, they were there targeting very specific individuals. Harry, uh, Harry was with them for some time, and uh, and they ran missions with us. And occasionally, uh, we would get a phone call and say, "Hey, you're pretty close to our guy. Can you nab him?" We said, well, sure, what do you want us to do? We need to take down this building. Sure, okay. The, these are the, the, the different kind of conversations that are happening on in between, in between the scenes of warfare. These are the, the interests from other nations that when you start to identify, you're like, wow, we all have common problems, but you have very specific type of problems. Um, there were a couple of nations that were unrepresented. There was a large swath of Chinese fighters that we found in there. Um, a big uh, swath of uh, Chechen fighters in there as well. Um, when you get to the core of this, and we started pulling these individuals out, they weren't Arabic speakers. This was what became really challenging. When we did pull ISIS fighters out, they didn't speak Arabic. They can say a few things, they knew a few prayers, but that's all the Arabic they knew. They were either English speakers, Chinese speakers, we had a few German speakers in there, and so the diversity of our own language set became very much of a challenge. And so be able to communicate and be able to say, hey, we've got a prisoner that we need, a, we need you to, uh, to get a handle of uh, was, part of the, it was pretty key to all of this. So what kind of enemy are we facing? Um, <clears throat> this is off. So you imagine we, we, had, we had contained, that's a good contained symbol there. We had contained that, uh, that portion of Mosul basically on one side of the river. We had an element down, a division down to the south that they couldn't break out, and we cut off their supply line between Talafar and Mosul. Basically, we closed the gate. We had gave them every opportunity to run away and get out of the city, uh, and we would pick them off on the road. But there was a point in April where we decided enough's enough, we're going to close off the city. So we swung around, the army came around with this division, it was an armored division, uh, and we came up to the very first location um, called the Badouche Heights as well as Badouche. Badouche was a city outside the city. Um, it was also responsible for the, uh, the Mosul prison. Um, a bit of a morbid um, portion of this is when we found um, remnants and videos of the Cubs of the Caliphate. I don't know if you've ever heard that term. Cubs of the Caliphate were children um, at between the ages of 8 and 12 uh, at the start of 2013. And um, just outside of Badouche to the west, between Badouche and Mosul, we found Mosul Prison. Uh, and that's where they trained the Cubs, of, the Cubs of the Caliphate. The Cubs of the Caliphate were eight to 12-year-old kids 
that learned how to clear rooms by clearing prison rooms with the prisoners in them live. Um, and so being able to train live like this was part of the mentality and part of the narrative that they wanted to uh, want to discuss. And I'll go back and touch this really quick. The difference between Shiite and Sunni and the difference between Sunni and, uh, and ISIS uh, and the Islamic State. So Shia, Shia and Sunni, there, there is a, there's an old tale about uh, the split between the two. Uh, and this is specifically about the, um, the, the, the rights on who becomes the heir of, um, uh, from Muhammad, who gets, the, uh, who gets to run the religion or um, uh, you know, uh, running, running the program, as, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, because Muhammad had no children, um, he had a couple of descendants. He also had disciples. And there goes the split. His nephew uh, was really who uh, he wanted, or as at least expressed as who, who he wanted, or who they thought would be the rightful heir. And then there were the disciples. The disciples were of the Sunni faith, and that kind of breaks that direction. The, <coughs> the, uh, the nephew is the other faith, the Shia faith. Well, the reason the fissure happened is because the disciples killed the nephew. And then there goes your split. Um, not as, may, maybe a little bit more simplistic than Protestant <laughs> Catholic, but when you have that split, um, the, one of the key functions of this, and the, the, the sort of backward looking at this, ISIS's narrative was that the purest time that the faith of Islam ever stood was thousands of years ago. So everything was about moving backwards instead of moving forward. So if you have a, a vision of your future in the past, it's fatal. It, it, it's, a fatal it's a fatal end no matter which way you look at it. Part of their, um, their fantasy, which is part of ISIS's fantasy, and they, their narrative, and you can, you can look this up, it's pretty fascinating, that they would die in their capital at the hands of the Shia unclean. If you think about what we're doing, we were literally fulfilling their faith. We were fulfilling their fantasy, that they wanted to die on their piece of ground because it was for their faith. And it was one faith after another, because most of the fighters and most of the Iraqi security forces uh, were of Shia faith. And we did have some Sunni uh, fighters in there as well. But that is part of this entire narrative that we're fighting against. And the media that they're pushing every day is fulfilling their narrative. The end times are coming for all that are faithful. And every day that they would publish something new, you could see part of that fulfillment uh, happening every day. So Badoosh, what kind of fighters are we fighting? So we're fighting Cubs of the Caliphate. We're fighting these guys. And so in 2013, an 8 to 12-year-old, by the time 2017 came around, the commander of Badoosh was a 14-year-old kid. If you look down there in the bottom left-hand corner, and probably somebody can identify what that is. What is that? What's that look like? Terrain model. It's a terrain model. It's a damn terrain model. We came into, the damn, we came into one of the houses in Badoosh. It was actually the 14-year-old's house. He was trained by a couple of fighters and he had an entire replica of Badoosh set up in his house and he was fighting his defense off a terrain model. What's that sound like? It sounds like us, right? So then, again, there, there's some sophistication with your, we just had no idea. No idea. And so you think that, hey, this is just a bunch of guys who are out there running around fighting. They're sophisticated. There's a, res a level of respect you have for your adversary. And so in this case, when we cleared Badoosh um, and we cleared the cement factory, which was another challenge, there was bombs left everywhere. Uh, everything was rigged. And that was sort of a, that was a, a look into the future. When we realized things were rigged to blow, um, not just humans, but also buildings as well as vehicles, we realized very quickly that this is going to be very messy all the way to the end. So we closed the, uh, we closed the ha half off. Can we go to the next... Uh, Actually, jump here. You know the Pentagon. Pentagon is our uh, our permanent location uh, for commanding uh, the joint force across the globe. They have a Pentagon too. It's in the bottom right corner. It was called the Jabori Hospital. It had the dominant terrain. That's where they would call their chief of staff, uh, who commanded his organization from. Uh, he had all of his sub commanders out throughout the city. We attempted to bring that building down probably a dozen times. Never was successful. It was reinforced. We shot multiple toes, multiple snipers and uh, sniper shots in that building. 
Um, when this picture is actually taken by a quadcopter flying up to the building, eventually got shot down. It was one of the last pictures we got. And when we got right up to into it, the um, the last picture we got was a uh, ZSU on a rail that would slide up and down four different levels of them, and they had them sliding back and forth, and basically a seat, and they could just slide back and forth in the ZSU. And it was, do it was dominant terrain, so it was about I think it was 14 stories total. So the challenge is, it looks down on everything. And so anytime you approach a city, you're getting zinged. Uh, and no matter how many, how many shots you can see, right, you can, only, you can see directly through the building, uh, that dominant piece of terrain was, we did everything we could to try to take it down, we just couldn't. And so we, we were, under the entire time, you're fighting with and basically an element that had an uh, anti-aircraft gun that can shoot downward on you the entire time. So challenging. And they had a 5,000 meter range. Um, so very, very challenging. So as we breach into the city and, and go to the northern half, one of the things that was really important with not only ourselves but being able to uh, communicate is being able to talk commonly to everyone. Everyone needs to have the same picture. Everyone needs to, uh, needs to understand what is actually going on on the ground. Because if you don't have that, it gets very confusing, particularly for your pilots or anyone else that's supporting you. They want to do everything they can, but if they don't have a good picture of where you're at and what the terrain looks like, it becomes very difficult. The left side of the picture, you've got what we identified as three women off the left, and then one ISIS fighter coming out. This was typical for the terrain uh, after we had fought and come in, and this is about the time when they were starting to give up and, and coming to our location. And this is what we would see, it was common. Very, very difficult to get out of the terrain because we rubbled it, but if it's difficult to come out, it's also difficult to go in. Uh, and so that became another completely different challenge as well. And uh, if you look down the bottom left uh, hand corner, this is actually not one of my pictures. This is actually one of ISIS's pictures that they delivered uh, during our entrance into the city. This was called 17 Tammuz. 17 Tammuz is uh, 17 July, it's literal, literal translation. This was the ISIS bank. It was an affluent uh, neighborhood. And when we got into the city, uh, the Iraqis heard that this was the ISIS bank. I had never seen Iraqi security forces move so fast and so quick and so determined because they knew where they were going to. They knew that this was where the gold, the silver, they knew this was where the money was at, the cash, as well as all the paintings that were stolen out of museums. And so when we got into there, surprisingly all that stuff was cleared out, uh, we, did get, we did get a few remnants of gold bars uh, pulled out of there. Uh, this was their bank. Uh, this is how they were funding their war from this location. Um, it was a pretty nice city, uh, portion of the <coughs> buildings were huge, and mansions, uh, and we ended up uh, setting up shop in, in one of those locations. But when it came down to the me message that was being delivered, it was about us stealing from them, it was about us dislocating their families and kicking them out, and it was about, out, uh, about us rubbling and destroying their, their city. Um, the family down there that's escaping from Mosul, there was quite a few that were identified as family members of ISIS. It's hard to tell the difference between the two. There were some that were kept captive, but it was about this time where we realized that um, the last and the end was, was get ready to come. Uh, all the bridges were taken down in between. There's a total of five. They were all destroyed. Uh, and then at one point we had to rebuild bridges, uh, floating bridges, um, to be able to get our uh, troops back and forth across uh, both sides. So the last bit here where Zanji as well as Babson Jar campaign uh, really became uh, towards the end. And this is where we saw most of the foreign fighters. Why this was important and really where, where we really started gaining a lot of aspects of the, the advantage is when we were able to get the intelligence, both relevant intelligence but also releasable intelligence, which was really important. It's one thing to be able to have, hey, I've got a secret document, I can't show it to you but it's really important. Well, how does that work for a guy that's getting ready to go into the fight the next day? So every type of piece of, uh, anything that we got, whether it was you know, direct video feed, uh, whether it was a key piece of intelligence about, the, uh, about a, an ISIS fighter or a group of ISIS fighters in some location, no matter what level of secrecy it was at, we all knew that it expired at some point. And so this was an effort to be able to get our intelligence community to understand that we have to be able to release this to our partners, because they need to know where they're going into. 
This is not about pointing to a map and saying, hey, there's something here, I can't tell you what it is. This is about being able to give them real information, showing them pictures, things that we are not, as a nation, not comfortable doing, but we do it. And this was one of the key, key aspects in this particular fight towards the end uh, that really had a lot of applicability. So, middle there, that's, uh, that's Donnie. Okay, climbing the mountain. Yeah, uh, and that's... Um, Steve. That's Steve. So, uh, one of our British uh, embeds into, uh, into Two Fury, and then Command Sergeant Major Donaldson's down there uh, at the end, down there. The little red circle right there, that's uh, 120 meters long by 70 meters wide total. And it wasn't the entire area, that's uh, just between the two bridges. This is the uh, getting ready to go into the old Mosul campaign. And what we saw was ISIS go to a completely different level. In a sense that when, when we started first seeing, the, the, the tempo was once you were able to secure a city, there was a natural tendency to let the, the bullets kind of die down, sort of the, the indirect fire barrage kind of lay off a little bit, to allow the civilians to, to, to come out. They would come out in swaths. You knew that ISIS no longer had a control of the area if, if civilians were allowed to start walking. Because if they were, if they were start, start to walk, and ISIS still controlled, they would kill them. And so once you started seeing large groups of individuals started coming in this direction, uh, you realize, yes, hey, we've got, we've got civilians coming our, our way. We got conditioned. This is about seven, eight months into this, and said, oh, this is not good. Um, we, we were getting conditioned on this natural pause and pulling back out. By the way, this is all during Ramadan. So your fighters are not eating or drinking water all day. Both ISIS as well as your Iraqi security forces. I participated as well, it sucked. Uh, but I, but I, the reason I participated is because I didn't want to hear them, their bitching. I didn't want to hear them talking about how I can't eat and I can't drink and, because I'm in Ramadan. But the, the significance of Ramadan is important. If you are participating in Ramadan as a fighter, fighting for your faith, and there were, called, there were a couple of days called power days. These were the nights, uh, special nights during Ramadan. If you die during Ramadan while fighting for your faith, while you're participating in Ramadan, you meet the highest level of heaven, in, in a sense. You are a martyr of the highest level. This is the mentality on both sides. And so you think that fighting is intense before. When we start moving into June, it becomes really nasty, and it's at the end. And it's the last few nights of power, the, the power nights of, uh, of Ramadan. Going all to the end, we started seeing this. We started seeing the rubble becoming so challenging. And at, uh, at Steve's feet in the far left right there, it's hard to see. Uh, that's a part of someone's shoulder and face. And uh, on his right foot is, the, um, is a suicide vest. A couple of things towards the end that we noticed, and the reason we had to be careful about this transition when, when civilian populations started coming our way, they started changing their tactic. The very first time we saw it, we saw an old man with a wheelchair. He couldn't get through the rubble. He had his grandson in his lap. He was pushing. People were trying to lift him, move him forward. Iraqi security forces do this. They, they run out to him. And they pick him up. And they start moving him uh, with the son. And they get him back to the grouping where the rest of the Iraqi security forces is. Uh, they pick the boy off. Once the boy got picked off, his entire uh, wheelchair was packed with C4. Killed everybody, uh, 12 guys, all at the same time, including a few civilians as well. So that was the first inkling that, hey, we're, we're changing this dynamic. The second time uh, was uh, all um, ladies and burkas, all walking out. They had uh, their children in their hands coming out. And um, you know, we're telling them to come in, hey, come slowly, we need to check you out. There came a point where Iraqi security forces were on either side of them, funneling them through, they dropped their kids, opened their things, shot a few rounds, and then clacked off their suicide vest. About 10 of them, a dozen, something like that. We saw it you know, all live, and we're watching this, and we were going, okay, this is, this is unacceptable. By the time we get to here, the level of desire to have this thing finish is so high among both the Iraqi security forces as well as us, and, and ISIS as well. One of the techniques we started using when we started receiving civilians here at the end is that um, uh, Iraqi security forces actually came up with the idea and said, hey, um, are you okay if we, uh, if we make everyone take their clothes off? I'm like, I don't care. Like, shoes off everything? 
their feet are going to be destroyed in this. He's like, they, they were just tired. They were tired of losing lives to suicide vests. And so the very first few announcements, it didn't go well. Um, there were a couple of casualties uh, as they were uh, jumping out. But the war got, war got back very, very quickly. And you saw people stripping their clothes off completely nude. Because it was better to survive with a little humility towards the end instead of being shot or dying on both sides. Um, but in the end here, every bit of them was Iraqi security, I, I, ISIS families, every bit, every bit of them. Everyone that was giving up were, they were a little heavier, they had a little bit more food, they were a, bit, a little bit more well taken care of, and we realized very quickly, like, oh, these are the people that were running the show. And these are their families. So this is uh, two days until the final day. Uh, that's me with, uh, with one of the Iraqi division commanders. He's had a pretty rough day. And you can look at the ground there, and that was very typical towards the end. Some of the challenges, when you're talking about the authorities and down to a lieutenant to the captain, they would be able to drop bombs. So what really became a challenge is that when you, you do this to a city, imagine an entire city block, multiple city blocks, and you level every building that's recognizable. How do you know what you're shooting at anymore? How are you able to direct any position? And you have grid locations. You can say, hey, I, I want it dropped on this, grid, this 10 digit grid. Great, got a 10 digit grid, you punch it in. And then the bomb drops, it's, it's 50 meters off, 100 meters off. Like, that's weird, that doesn't make any sense. And you realize that your land markers have shifted, the entire ground has shifted. This is a city of antiquity, so you've got seven layers of city underneath it. And uh, ISIS went underground. Um, two days before this was probably one of my roughest days. Uh, and you have ISIS fighting to get to ground because that was the way they can get to the drinking, well, the river water, which is not drinking water, but they were drinking the river water to survive. On, on a couple days before this, um, we, we had uh, hit, a, hit one of the buildings, had a secondary explosion, kicked a bunch of people out. They all fell down the bank to the bank of the river. And we, when, uh, when we saw this, we slewed our camera over there to look from the other side, and there was probably about 50 to 60 bodies just on top of one another. Some of them were still alive, some of them were not. Um, and uh, there's a um, there's an Islamic um, uh, essentially rule. Um, this, the moment you ever kill an innocent, uh, you lose your right to heaven. Um, and uh, if you don't do everything you can to save the, the, those that are innocent, um, yeah, you have no, uh, no future. And so you see children on the bank of this river. Uh, one, of the, one of the sort of more grotesque uh, situations where um, a mom was holding uh, about a two, three month old, and her arms were rigor mortis, because she was dead. The baby was trying to claw out of her arms and there was a grouping of kids all getting together, because these are the only, thing, the only ones that are alive left. So the Iraqis see this, and they, they get a boat and, and down there. And one of the, I remember saying, like, this is not a good idea, guys. We should not do this. I know that they're children. I know you want to do everything you can, but we cannot save them. It, it's done. If they can swim across the river, great. But you can't save them on the bank. Uh, they didn't listen to me. Uh, they, um, they took about three or four guys, started crawling over the bodies, and that's when it started happening. Um, beneath the bodies were probably a few more ISIS fighters, and they are all waiting to clack their vests off. Every body, all the 50, 60 bodies stacked, all had vests as well. And it's not just uh, sea forts, you know, it's nails and ball bearings and stuff, and so they clacked them off, and you could just see bodies being broken up while all the children just killed immediately. And, and it, it made me realize that, that they were willing to go to, to an end that, frankly, we were not. Um, and so n after that, those three guys were killed. We ended up uh, not going back to that location, not having to go back to that. But here towards the end, the, the fight became very nasty. Um, and uh, I do have a video um, that uh, how, how do you how do you finish this? You got, we had about 1,000 fighters left. They were underneath the ground. They would pop up occasionally and, um, and, and shoot as long as they could until they died. They tried to break the line so they could shoot their, uh, they could hit their vests off. But how do you do this, right? In a way, it was a complex problem. It was, a, like I said, about a football field size. So we came up with the idea of 
all these bulldozers that we pass coming in, all these vehicles that we, let's, let's use the bulldozers and start clearing paths. Fill, hole, fill the holes in. And uh, they created a little da gasoline and a little uh, dish soap, uh, mixed it up, poured it down the holes, lit it on fire, and uh, let it just kind of seep down as it, as it went and then cover the holes up as they go. So it wasn't about burning anybody. It was about pull, pull the oxygen out of the area so they basically um, uh, asphyxiate. So this was the last few hours where we're just bulldozing uh, all the rubble to be able to get to the path where you need to because you couldn't even walk over it. Your boots were completely destroyed within a matter of hours. Uh, most of the soldiers there were just wrapping tape around their boots because of all the shards and all the rebar and everything else. Um, so that, that was the end. And we moved over to, uh, to Talafar. The last remaining 500 <coughs> fighters went from Talafar up to Afghani. Talafar is about half the size of Mosul. Uh, it took us about uh, a week to take Talafar. It did not take us seven months. Uh, because we used the same, same, very similar tactics, but while at the same time, the message got out. So they moved up to Afghani with the last remaining cash that they had. They tried to cross the border into to Kurdish land, where Herod was at, uh, and the Kurds stopped them at the border. So that was, that was where we were at for, uh, for that time frame. Uh, and I, I'm going to close it out with kind of explaining some of these things, and then I'll wait for some questions. So the last bit, uh, this is the Mosul capital flag. Uh, we pulled it down probably about uh, when we got to 17 to news. Uh, it was sometime in, in June. Uh, this was the capital city flag. We were able to pull this one down. Uh, real bolt holes and everything else, but um, pretty good size uh, piece. It was We could see it every day going in. And when we finally got to it, we were able to take it down. This is the Talifar capital flag. Uh, obviously, they did not switch it out, and uh, that was what was left for the, uh, the Tal uh, Talifar capital flag. Um, this is hung upside down. Brian's at top, the circle's at the bottom. Um, there's nothing derogatory on this. It just says, uh, uh, there is only one God, and Muhammad is his, uh, uh, Muhammad is his prophet. So it's a, it's a fairly benign uh, symbol, but the actual picture of this, this particular black on white, uh, was a symbol of ISIS. So those two were taken down. Um, these were taken off of fighters. Uh, you, if you come over here, I, I challenge you to smell it. Um, it has its own uh, particular type of aroma. Uh, it smells like blood, it smells like gunpowder, it smells like the, the, the rubble and the grit of that city uh, when you pull them out of the rubble. A couple of these other pieces are um, uh, books that we pulled out of the Pentagon. Uh, Algebraic Hospital. In the basement, they had a, a library. These were only a few of the pieces. The rest of them got donated uh, to different libraries. This one was uh, pretty interesting. Uh, if, you, if any of you have a phone, um, Google Translate, you can move your Google Translate picture over, and it'll actually translate it for you with your phone. You guys have the app, it's pretty easy. But that's what we were doing. We were basically pulling and translating as we go. Like, this is a, uh, a book on how to proselytize, how to speak in front of people how to deliver your message, how you posture yourself, how you be able to get the charisma out of the group, how you dive into individuals and pull them back. You can probably, you know, you can probably, you know, trace this back to probably some of Billy Graham's speeches or something along those lines. This is one of the key fundamental pieces that you look at when they talk about trying to get the right individuals into the room. How do you get them? There's a couple other pieces that are here. One's pretty broken up, but they had a fascination. So um, you probably have heard fascism attracts fascism. So if you're, you know, a Italian fascist, you kind of like, you know, German fascist. If you're a Japanese fascist, you kind of like Nazism as well. So they were fascinated with Nazism. They were fascinated with the idea that you can eradicate entire peoples, uh, and uh, not necessarily they weren't necessarily worried about race, but they were worried about faith. And so. Um, there are several books about Nazi Germany and their impacts on the way that they thought. Um, there's a bunch of them that's in here. A couple of these other ones in here, this one's a pretty good, pretty good one as well. These are, um, this is the history of World War II in, uh, in here. This is also history of World War II, and you've got some, some great pictures in here. We got a couple that are of, let's see if that one is it. A couple that are up here of Hitler. Pieces of distance to Kevin McCord. 
uh, a couple of different uh, pictures of Americans in here uh, and uh, 80 seconds in here. Uh, pretty, pretty interesting little over now. So, uh, I invite you to come up here and touch what you want, but uh, that's pretty much all I got. So thanks for your time. I appreciate it.